your soldiers rest a bed For what they need here's mother courage With woolen coats and boots that fed They fight for God and legal tender I'll see them clothed and feed them well And bless the boys in all their splendor As they march down the road to hell Now spring has come and winter's dead the snow has gone, so draw a breath. Let Christian souls crawl out of their beds, pull on their socks. Mother Courage is um, Fiona Shaw. I think that's my starting point, um, as it is with all work, really. I think um, I put actors in the centre of the work and, and work from there. Fiona is, is going to bring all sorts of things to this part that uh, I, I haven't even dreamt of yet. I mean, that's why one longs to go into rehearsal, to, to, to put that group together and to start seeing what, what, what's possible, and, and, then, and then the work begins. It's a very big play that deals with the subject of war. We seem to be engaged in, in as many, if not more, wars than we were before, so uh, this play feels most timely. It's extremely witty. It's not a heavy play that deals with the subject of war. It's almost irreverent, the way that the subject is dealt with. It's very slippery what Brecht is actually saying whether you could really say this is an anti-war play, I don't know. Mother Courage isn't anti-war, she thinks it's marvellous. She profits from war. She's very keen to keep the war going so that she can continue to profit. We don't quite know what we think of her. And I think that should be so right the way through the night. She's tricky. She's very tricky. She's exciting because she's tricky. She's uh, full of contradictions. We, we recognize her. Whether we approve of her or not is neither here nor there. No. We recognize ourselves in parts of her. We must not second guess that we think we know everything about Brecht. He's more sophisticated, more slippery, more exciting than to, 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 to be summed up in a theory. You know, it's, it's very, it's experimental work, I think, to have a good look at Brecht now and to see what we can do and how we can make it an, anew and um, how we can make it feel immediate. I think there are very shocking moments in Mother Courage, and perhaps we should be talking about it in that respect. I think there are moments when something happens that we thought could not happen within the comfort of that evening. 
And that's, I think, what, uh, what I'm excited about at the moment, is to create a situation through perhaps, you know, with the help of design, through, through what we present as scenically, where we didn't think that actually somebody was going to die in scene three, and they do. You know, I think the death of Swiss cheese is there to be profoundly shocking. Uh, I think the death of Catherine is profoundly shocking. So, uh, you know, from a personal point of view, I'm excited by the journey to, to see what I discover in this play. You know, I, I, I hope to be very surprised by it. I think I will be very surprised by it. And, you know, the Olivier is a wonderful theatre for it. It's a big public theatre, you know. It's a theatre for, for the big public debate plays. It's a theatre for, for the nature of theatre where, where audience and actors together make the night. You know, whatever he is now is not what he was five years ago, ten years ago, or, you know, many decades back. He's going to be a different Brecht to the one I found you know, when I came here first to do The Good Person of Sichuan, which was in the Olivier. You know, the Brecht we find now, I know, of course, it's a different play, but he'll be a different Brecht. You know, that is, that is the nature of greatness, that these creatures change with the time. Theatrical illusion must be partial, so that it can always be recognised as illusion. Art is not a mirror with which to reflect reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. The question of what artistic devices we should choose is simply the question of how we can get our audience to become socially active, how we can knock them into shape. We should try out each and every conceivable artistic device which can help towards this aim, whether it's old or new. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he said that he would like on his tombstone the words, you know, he made suggestions, we carried them out. He doesn't say he made orders or he made, uh, you know, demands and we carried them out or he commanded us. He, said he thought this might work and this might work and that might work. And I think that the theoretical writing is absolutely like that. He really had almost a strangely split mind between the academic part of him that wrote theory and the man of the theatre who refused. He would, even in rehearsal, say, I don't know what idiot wrote this theory or uh, I don't know what idiot wrote this part of the play. I mean, that said, I think that uh, what one gets from reading the theoretical work is somebody who is grappling with uh, the profoundest uh, truths about the theatre and the very heart of what we talk about when we talk about the quality that we describe as theatrical. He sees a creeping naturalism that he knows in part is going to come from the most unnatural of all media, from film, and he's saying don't try and compete with this. You know, you're going to lose and it's not interesting. I mean I think that what he's really talking about is um, the, the essential dialectic of the theatre, which is that it creates um, an illusion that is um, both effective and not at the same time, that it asks you to believe deeply in something that you are absolutely aware is artificial and fake, and that you hold both of those um, feelings and awarenesses, uh, um, uh, belief and disbelief, um, in the same place, in the same impossible tension, and that you start to understand through theater, I think he means to say, uh, the, the double nature of reality. But that's what life is like. Um, you know, you can have Leona Lewis singing um, for the boys out, out in Afghanistan to try and lighten things up. And then five minutes after she's gone, poof, and we're not meant to sit comfortably and predict what's going to happen because that's not what this play is about and I think the more they throw in things that are unexpected the more that they shake you up when you feel like you know where this is going. I mean, the, the new sort of modern way of talking about it is distanciation and I think that um, you know it's making the familiar strange and the strange familiar as he says and as I, as I was just saying I feel that there's a, in a way theatre does that automatically. Gary Safton uh, in the play, who's the guy? Who's the guy? He plays the sergeant at the start, and he he does all the bombs, and he 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 does sound effects. He does the sound effects and various things. Um, that to, that to me is alienation. Oh! 
because you see something that exists outside of the play, but in some weird way, and I still can't articulate why, in some weird way that drew, that, that was drawing me further into what was happening on the stage. Because there was something, you have, you have the narrative and you have the story of what's going on, and then all of a sudden there's a man who exists outside the play doing sound effects of a bomb going off, of something else, but you see, but the people are experiencing what he is doing outside the play as a reality. And it does, it does something very strange. Now that's bricked, absolutely bricked, you know, very simple. And you may have noticed that also the stage personnel, such as the sound, lights, you know, and the, the stage technicians, where they would normally wear black, they would be in black during, during the production on stage, but not on this particular play. And Deborah Warner didn't want that. She wanted everyone to come as they are in their own clothes. Stone by stone they climb on their efforts to make them warm and weak. Broken down they barely make it back to bed. It's not only that you can see all the stage crew coming on to do what their job would be, you know, behind the scenes. What Deborah has done as well is she has taken every single wall away, everything, and you see that, that you see the theatre itself as the theatre is. A limbo star, mother Courage observes the funeral of the fallen imperial And for some people, it's just visually exciting. For some people, I'm sure. It meant a great deal in, 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 in terms of Brechtian theory. For some people, it would, have, it would have said something about war and about humanity and about us all. So it was, it was, an, it was another layer. His ideas of alienation, uh, when he was writing this play, would have been staggering to the audience. They would have been very disconcerting. And all those methods have just been taken up as general practice. I mean, every... Um, Every play since then, well not every play, but it's become very typical theatre language to see lights, to have abstract scenery, to have music. All, all the Brechtian techniques of alienation are used very regularly. I and many of my colleagues, you know, Simon McBurney, me, all of us have been have made theatre within, you know, the slipstream of this extraordinary miracle of what Brecht actually did. Courage is a businesswoman because she is a mother. She can't be a mother because she is a businesswoman. You know, she's just on this relentless journey to keep herself and her children alive. We're merchants. We shall meet and show us that we're friendly people. Yeah, you look friendly. And she doesn't manage it. And this happens again and again. You know, she 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 makes a couple of bob on her selling a buckle, and, and her son gets taken away. Look what you've done oh. with your haggling and hanging on. But she's just fixated on making money and profiting from this war. Actually, what works out best for us is what they call paralysis. It's a shot here, a shot there, one step forward, one back, troops going no place, needing provisioning. <laughs> well, end of scene six, when Katrine has been disfigured, courage sort of screams and we can all sympathize with this war. It's a, it's a curse, this fucking war. It is just a curse. This fucking war! And then the next scene is a year later, and, or several years later, and she's screaming about how wonderful war is, and anybody who knocks the war is no friend of hers. I won't let you knock the war. Everyone says the weak are exterminated. But the weak don't fare any better in peacetime. War feeds her people better. All the time we were fascinated, weren't we? I mean, we never, we were horrified that this woman didn't learn, horrified that this woman, when she did learn, held on to it for what, the length of the interval. We all found it difficult to get to the heart of this. You know, who is she? It's really difficult to know where this deals with war. It is asking us to put on stage 
um, the part of war that is about tremendous energy, you know. It has to have that spirit in it. It has to. This play has to. Otherwise, we don't get her. We don't understand what keeps her going. It isn't drudgery and mud and depression that keeps her going. It's the fact that she gets high on it. She loves it. She is a hyena of the battlefields. You know, she's kind of roaring when the going gets rough. You know, she's she she. She fuels herself with it. It's about, I guess, a woman, a woman ignoring a lot of things and trying to, trying to keep moving. It's about a woman trying to keep moving, I guess, with a wagon. I better be getting back. Getting back. This is. <laughs> We, we were within the £10 season. We did know that we had a very, very big show in a very, very big theatre, and we had half the budget that a big show in that big theatre would normally have. We decided to think of that positively, to make a virtue in this time of the credit crunch, and to try and make, if you will, credit crunch theatre. So our very first thought was, you know, how could we fill that stage with something that wouldn't cost anything? I think the Olivia has certain big challenges, and one of them for me is the height, and the, the height's delicious in some ways, but often you have quite dead air above something. Um, you have actors down there, and then you have this, it's like a church sometimes, is that it's not, it's not quite full enough, the space above the actors, and if you can't fill it with set, or, we quite quickly thought, how can we change this completely, and that was to have white back walls. So I said, let's paint the shutters white, that'll be cheap. So those three white shutters at the back um, actually changed everything, really, because we're not that much used to playing against white in um, the theatre still, and certainly not in the living. With the white, you never have this moment when any light is beautiful, just one dark, in the, as you have in the darkness. You work with the, for the energy, which you should find through the play, through the production, through things. And in Mother Courage, it is very much about a very brash energy, sort of to bring things forward to the audience. We ended up sort of trying to out Brecht, Brecht if you like, and, uh, and really take what he had suggested and push it to its most extreme. So doing absolutely no representation of, of scenery or as little as we possibly could, and, and just handwritten signs, um, which is pure Brecht. So not having a big budget, we thought we'd put the emphasis on light, sound, video, side by side with the idea that it should look like a gig, because in, if you go to um, a gig and you look at it, it's light, it's sound, um, it's often video projection, it isn't any set in that normal sense. And then Tom and I would work on how we could still have a very, very um, exciting and strong um, uh, canvas, really, for, 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 for all those, those other crafts to work. Nothing prepares you for the, for, you know, the actual day we saw the real set in the tech, and it was truly, truly astonishing to see something so epic. And that's when, as the actors, you realise back in rehearsals what she was asking you to do was you have to match <laughs> you have to match your character and and physical being with this set <laughs> He wrote very interestingly about what he wanted the music and Mother Courage to do. You know, he wanted it to to blare out like a jukebox at the end of a 
of a pier or an amusement arcade. He wanted it to, he wanted it to be, to wake us up. He wanted it to be, um, out of tune, if you will, you know, he wanted it to be big and bold and, um, and explosive. And I thought, well, you know, these are very heady things to begin with. I mean, how you then get them to happen is a very good question. <laughs> song when the drum riser comes up with the cart and with the whole band you know on center stage full on with a song as a as a like a rock opening of a rock concert because Fiona Shaw is on top of the cart uh, singing and and she's like a, a rock goddess there you know well, the moment Fiona and I knew we were going to do this we both said um, the first thing that we have to do is is is, is get new get a, get a new score, get get new music, and get a contemporary artist to to be doing that. Uh, I, I was in LA last year and saw this guy Duke Special at a at a at a do, and he was playing, and he was fantastic. And it was his it was a combination of things. He was neither modern nor old. His music has a sort of Weimaresque element, and yet it's rock. Um, it's not pastiche of anything, it's sort of its own blend. He had all the virtues of being you know, a, a contemporary artist working in, 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 in pop and, and, and rock, but also being, a, a, I think, a very, very sensitive um, songwriter. It's a very old song about that. From the beginning, um, um, Deborah was keen that I was involved in some way in singing the songs. Not because the actors couldn't sing, but because she just had this idea, having kind of seen what I did in my own shows, that perhaps there would be a role for me. Um, so in their uh, previous productions, the, the characters have sung the songs, but um, gradually we, this kind of character for me became where I was almost like a... I guess like a, the spirit or the thoughts of the, the actor or the character in that particular song. On his head a thorny crown That the soldiers admit him yeah, I feel that the music that he's written is really interestingly civilian as opposed to military. I mean, Dessau wrote it with a plinky plinky trump, uh, piano and a, and a little tin trumpet and a drum, so it sounded like an army band. And uh, what these songs are is, uh, I think, echoes and remnants of uh, a civilian life that the war has swept away. But then, but then you get a vet song, which is so heartbreaking. You, you know, you have a play which predominantly everybody goes, to, you know what I mean, it's, it's war, it's war, it's war. And you get that one song and you realise that it's a woman whose heart has been broken, regardless of what she is, regardless of what people call her, you know, being a prostitute. And I think that's about love. That's amazing sitting there. And the music he wrote for that as well is incredible. We were in the first week of rehearsal and I remember they came in and um, he did a gig. And I think that was the first song they played. And the whole, just everyone in the room was gobsmacked by that one song. We the soldiers, the army took our time, I was 16. The foreign occupier grinned as he listened my night gone.
maybe in, in the music, the fact that it has embraced emotion it, it, more than the original score is, is maybe, it just makes people think of and, you know, the ideas in the play in a different way. Um, I think sometimes when you become so familiar with something, you kind of lose what, what the actual thing is. Um, and sometimes if it's painted in a different color, you kind of look at it again and, and notice new things in it. So I think that's, that's all we've done. Really. The most important object in the play is the cart that Mother Courage has for all her merchandise. From it we can see what her financial situation is each time she appears. She, she responds to it like it's completely her livelihood. She really would be stuck without it. A profit building exercise. We kind of looked at everything, every kind of cart you could imagine from these kind of things, even a pram, we wondered whether we could go that far. You know, things like that, just completely bonkers. This was a favor of mine. We looked at every kind of car. We looked at cars. I mean, we were going to have a car for a long time. But it wasn't, wasn't interesting. This I came across on holiday in Sicily, which was in a market. And after months and months of looking at every kind of car we possibly could, we found this one and thought, well, there's something in that. Um, it was a difficult one because once, once we found the world of the show and realised that we wanted to do something very abstract, um, and this kind of idea of almost an empty page, so white everywhere and nothing represented. Um, the cart became a real problem. What Fiona and um, all the other actors needed was something incredibly real. We decided that we wanted it to evolve during rehearsals and so, I mean the great thing about The National is that the rehearsal room is right next door to the workshops. So unlike any other place you can try things out and so Things like the, the walking plate around the cart um, was an idea I think Fiona had, and so we could just quickly build that and try it out. They needed something they could interact with and be another member of the family, and wanted to be all over the top, on top of it and inside it. And when they were inside it, they wanted a real existence. There's lots of things that we would sell, um, like shirts that are bound up with string labels on, ready to sell, and um, there's food that we would eat, um, candles, in a very OCD order, <laughs> um, perfume for men. Well, Fiona says some of Sophie's greatest work was done off stage, as it were, inside that cart. Fiona would go in the cart and Sophie was doing fantastic things, arranging toothbrushes and cleaning drawers and just living the life of that cart. We had a traditional cart in the end, in fact. And um, um, I suppose perhaps I'm surprised by that, but I, I think it was necessary. There's so much text about it. It's got to be... It's got to be believable. I think you actually are obliged to, 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 to be a little bit literal with that thing. I think Brecht said um, that the cart should be the fifth member of the family and that the journey of the cart should be another, another big journey, big epic journey. I liked that it got to the double-decker cart in the height of her business career, which I think was terribly funny. It got a satellite dish and an extension built on its roof. And then the very next scene, it's kind of completely collapsed. Uh, and that was a new cart. That was a cart that we, we replicated exactly the same and then just distressed it and distressed it until it was a, a kind of ghost. I think 
But our strongest part was the skeletal part of, of scene 10, you know, when she's hit the buffers and that, that very forlorn, almost, almost see-through, thin thing where you could almost see through the ribs of it. It was a, it was a, it was, I think that was the poetic cart. I think the cart has to have a poetry and has to have a poetic journey and I hope we did that. I've warmed up for 25 years, boy. Are you here to take the warm-up? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And up and down and straight in chin. Mm. Weren't, weren't we good last mm, night? You, you were so good. No, no, all of us, we were very good. I got a great um, text from Deborah saying the ensemble work was fantastic. She was really pleased. <sighs> um, how contagious is Charlotte? <laughs> No, much as much as I love her, she would have been contagious. You I, I, are you sure? Yes. When do I do? I don't be near her except for the I've seen eight. The, those bugs just sit like that, going, "Woo!" There's a tired actress I could jump on. <laughs> Hop. That's what they do. Hey, thank you very much. <clears throat> Nobody. <laughs> it all closes down. I'm uh, very all right, thank you. Apart from my vocal difficulties. How are you, babe? You look not too bad at all. <laughs> we love you, Charlotte, but we will not greet you for two days. I certainly can't afford to get it. I go insane. It would be a catastrophe now. Hello, hello. Hi. Very all right. Nice to see you. Yeah, to see you. Nice. <clears throat> Come on in. I've got a pile of visitors tonight. I've just got. I've got half of the half of America in. Really? I've got my lovely friend um, Susan Zygmunt and her husband Vilmos, who's the cinematographer. They've just done the Woody Allen film, and they're coming. And I've got Jennifer Chastain, who you should know, Jessica Chastain who's just done the Terry Malick film. She's lovely. She's oh, right. And she's coming. But, and others, I think, this month. That's my... That's so, my so no pressure, uh, No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No, it, was, it was terrific last night. Wasn't it? Yeah. Well, well done. It's absolutely thanks to you. No, no, really, no, really no, was. No. Glad you've turned up. <laughs> no, it was really terrific last night. Yeah. yeah what was it? Energy. Been... We got off text, actually. Yeah. It, it was, was text. It was incredibly clear. It was incredibly clear, and we precise. couldn't have done it without that kind of work run through. I mean, if ever there was a lesson, the lazy walkthroughs are the most demoralising thing after three weeks, and they don't work. No. And even though everyone has to work harder, it's a fantastic lesson. Never again do I want to do a a word run. No. It, if anything, I agree. it depress it it dulls the the thing. It does, yeah. But that felt like a real matinee or something, and it was like a free one. It felt proper, and it felt that by the end of it, that everybody was sort of like, right now we want to get on and do it. Yeah. And that was really good. That was really positive. And front through the song as well really helped. I think, oh, I think absolutely marvellous. Yeah. And uh, I think we were all very far away otherwise. Right. How are you, babe? All right. Good. How are you? Oh, uh. Um, well, I called in at the NO on my way down. And? I gave Deborah a jigsaw with the world on it because God made the world. Fair enough. That was quite good. Yeah, good. She, she went, for goodness sake, what do we do with that? I said, you can have it over Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Lots of fun at Christmas, I thought. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't go down as well as it might.
but she was very pleased with my crib good luck card. Excellent. Um, so she had a, a good luck card with a crib and yeah. a pop-up crib. I mean, you do that and the whole lot were there. Good. Baby Jesus and it. Work. Yeah. And the hallelujah chords. And the hallelujah chords. So uh, we've worked together over a long time. Um, we have worked together over a long time. Over 20 years we've done a lot of things, but not all the time. So we're not... I mean, I think actually we bring whatever we've done in the gaps to each new thing. If it's wrong, I know she knows it's wrong. She knows I know it's wrong. And we go and we fix it. We don't necessarily know how to fix it. We certainly don't have to defend anything. She certainly... She's never really... Uh, we really do understand... We have similar tastes, I suppose, you know, and probably developed by now. She has a very big, empty space in her mind. She's very focused on just one thing. She keeps space very empty. She doesn't get caught on things like politics or isms of any kind. She just releases the moment and releases seconds within the moment, moments within moments, groups of moments, and then slowly begins to see the revelation of a play. I'm much more likely to come in with some theory and try it out. And uh, I have lots of ideas, and she takes them and sifts them in some way, but never consciously, really. Just tests them. She's got the patience to test them. She has extraordinary patience, and then enormously demanding as well. So it's, um, I'd probably be less patient and be less demanding. How are you? All right, good. You? Yeah, nice. Bit vocally, a bit ropey, but uh, so I'm tiny at word. I've got big visitors. You comfy? Comfy. Nice Thank hair. You. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's a bit, a bit the Hillary Clinton tonight. No. Camden Town. Glastonbury meets. 17th century meets the curtains, meets the theatre. So they're kind of, you know, these are panniers from you know, the Elizabethan period, but actually these are Ruth Meyer's curtains. So what you're getting is a sense of theatre, as if we'd raided some magic box belonging to them. Uh, and then uh, 19th century romanticism. Eclectic, <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah, and I've forgotten my gloves. I've forgotten my gloves, that's good, isn't it? It's nice to forget the gloves. I'm about to do something very interesting. I'm about to do something really phenomenal, I think, which is to hold 12,000, 1,200 people in thrall for three hours. It takes a lot of energy, but it's also great fun. It's great fun because it's the sculpture of the human soul in action. Okay, I'm going to go now, and do you want to follow me? Have to pillage, but let your soldiers rest. Everyone's scared of anything changing. 
It's not the case that epic theatre is theatre that lacks drama, letting out a battle cry, in with reason, out with emotions. The critical attitude that epic theatre strives to bring to its audience can't be passionate enough. I found it exciting because I thought it was a tremendously um, popular piece of theatre making. I thought it, it really did appeal to very many different people. I hope you don't feel that you have ever to suspend your faculties against boredom when you're in the theatre. And I think that's what's being asked of, you know, people, be bored and then you're having a good experience. You're not. If we're not making it dazzling for you, you're not having the experience you deserve. So, you know, we've worked very hard at making it, not making it, allowing it to be at the full height of its excitement. His wife. And he, he always knew that, right, that in the end, fundamentally, theatre was entertainment, a thing that people have long since forgotten about him, because they think it's polemic or something, but it isn't, it's entertainment first. <laughs> virtuous being um, ruined in a capitalistic world. It's not, that's the message, but the message is over and over again. The really interesting thing is it's about people. Here's somebody. We don't know his name. Gotta be entered in the record with everything in this place. He bought a meal from you. We can see if you know. And this is an emotionally affecting play. You know, he does not keep that at a distance. Anybody who maintains that he does, I think, well, has, has to rethink that. He wants us to be affected by it, but in many different ways, not in one way. And it is terribly important when you're doing something that is political that there is space left for the individual audience member to enter themselves. I think you have to go in, you have to make a space which is very inviting or exciting, a place that will keep them there, but will allow the individual to work out for themselves why this might be disturbing, why this might be upsetting. You can't tell them. You don't want a history lesson in a play. You want to see how history, or the play's history, or the moment of history, jumps you right up in the face and meets you. You don't have to go and meet it. This play will endure. I mean, I think this is up there with his greatest, isn't it?